Emulsions are super important in food. You've heard me mention several of them before, but I'll recap them here. One of the most common kinds of emulsions in food is two different liquid phases mixed together where one is oily and one is watery. Mayonnaise is an example of an oil in water emulsion, but uh, so is just about every uh, sauce that you've ever had. So uh, salad dressings, for example, um, Bernays sauce, um, other things named sauce that aren't tomato sauce are almost all emulsions, gravy for example, is an emulsion. Um, there are other types of emulsions as well. Pretty much any phase you can think of then uh, as continuous, which is the one that is uh, continuous, it's throughout the medium, uh, could be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, and then any other, and then those same phases could be what is dispersed, solid, liquid, gas. There are no gas in gas emulsions, but there are solid in solid emulsions. That was part of what was happening with chocolate. There are liquid in solid emulsions. There are gas in solid emulsions. That's in fact, a great way of describing cake. Um, and here, when we are thinking about making frozen food, we are looking at, uh, at least initially, a solid in liquid emulsion. And probably by the end point, we may be looking for a liquid in solid emulsion. But in any case, even if we allow our uh, frozen food item to completely become a solid, uh, it starts as it begins to freeze as a solid phase appearing within a continuous liquid substance. And it is the chemistry of that we've got to get into. When we discuss this chemistry, you'll see that it is in fact very, very similar to forming bubbles. So something that we talked about with crackers uh, in a solid. And that's because the energetics, the thermodynamics of this are just about exactly the same with a small change in uh, constants and symbols representing what happens with a solid versus what happens with a gas. But the idea that it is very difficult, thermodynamically speaking, to create a new surface within a continuous medium is what uh, controls how things work for both bubbles appearing in a liquid, for everything from boiling to champagne to uh, making a well-leavened piece of bread. And it's the same thing as making solids within a liquid, which includes freezing. So to get a little further into this, let's imagine we are freezing some water. So let's uh, think about this at the moment, just about the water. And we start with liquid water, and we're gonna pull some energy out of that water, and we're gonna bring this to zero Celsius. Okay, and we know that zero is the freezing point of water. So you would expect at that moment to start seeing little crystals of water starting to form in uh, our bottle of water that we've stuck in the freezer. But actually that might not happen, especially if we are exactly at zero degrees Celsius. And to understand why we need to think about um, something connected with these emulsions. So let's zoom in here. If we have ice forming, so uh, ice doesn't actually make little cubes as it forms, but I'm going to draw it as a convenient idea. So there's a little cube, and that's forming. And before that, it was just liquid. So we have liquid, we have solid. And the thing is, um, when it's just liquid next to liquid water next to more liquid water, um, that's the same thing on both sides. Whereas it's liquid water and there's a solid surface in the middle there, they, uh, that ends up being um, the surface area between these two things ends up mattering. And we have what we call surface energy or uh, surface tension, 
is what it gets called when we're talking about uh, liquids, but there is a energy associated with uh, a surface. And often we can kind of ignore this when something is very big because the rest of its surface area is small with relationship to its bulk. So the fact that its surface may or may not love being where it is doesn't matter. But in the case of when we are forming a new solid where there wasn't a solid before, which is what's happening where we're freezing, uh, it, there's quite a lot of surface area relative to the mass. And in fact, um, one of the ways that we can think of the definition of surface tension, their surface tension, is as the amount that free energy changes uh, with respect to the amount of surface area there is. Uh, those of you who are not big thermo people, and it's okay if you aren't, that's not a big deal. What you need to know about G, which is Gibbs free energy, is negative means uh, gonna happen. And giving us the star of simplification, because there's a little more to it than that, but we'll just say that. So I'm gonna give the mathematicians in the uh, audience a, a headache by um, messing with this math a little bit. So surface tension is a, a number and it's a positive number. So we have a, a positive number over there. And so what happens when we are forming a new surface is this term up here uh, for this little thing is how much the uh, area changes. Well, the area is changing a very, that's the surface area, a very little bit. Like there was zero surface area when it was all liquid, and now there is some surface area. So our change goes from zero to some tiny little amount. So this is close to zero. Now, what happens when you have anything divided by close to zero? It blows up to infinity, right? Right, you're not allowed to divide things by zero. So if we want to get a nice normal number coming out on the left here, uh, and we are dividing by something that is very close to zero, that means this number has got to be huge. Huge amount of energy. So practically speaking, what does that mean? Well, it means one of two things. Uh, so either to go from liquid to solid, that first little step, we either must uh, have a, uh, so remove lots of energy. So it's not even merely the delta H of fusion. Oh no. Uh, it's much more than that, actually, that we have to remove. Um, or you have to uh, get out of this problem entirely by introducing a nucleation site. And what the heck is that supposed to mean? Well, this is a thing that we discovered before in chocolate. So uh, we have two, hang on, let me just do it this way. I will map two possibilities. So uh, we might have subcooled liquid. And the, uh, in this case, um, we're gonna pull lots and lots and lots of energy out. So what happens? We drop the temperature even lower. Uh, so we remove energy, uh, very low temperature, and uh, we drive what's kind of known as the, uh, the supersaturation ratio. So that is this here is super saturated. It's ready to be ice. It is much colder than uh, zero degrees. In fact, I think with zero uh, disturbance, you can get liquid water down to something like negative 30 Celsius before 
it will actually spontaneously overcome this huge energy barrier and make ice itself. So this might be negative 30 degrees Celsius. So that was remove lots of energy. That's that option. Your other option is what we call a nucleation site. What does that mean? So uh, you, it lets you sidestep this whole thing about delta G and delta uh, area altogether. You, instead of making the solution go from zero surfaces to grow a crystal on to creating its own surfaces, you add something. So you add nucleation. Uh, and these nucleation sites can be just about anything. Uh, like ideally, when we did this with chocolate, they were little chocolate crystals to begin with, but they could be dust. That's why dust in the atmosphere helps cloud formation, for example. Um, it could be uh, a fold in the plastic. If you're making an ice pop, it could be the rough surface of the stick. And then you will get frozen and it won't have to be all that cold. You know, so, so freezing closer to uh, zero degrees Celsius. And uh, let's, let's watch a little video of that. So let's go to the freezer and see what happens here. I have some freezy pops in this freezer that you see are 100% liquid as I take it out of the freezer. The freezer is at negative four Celsius, so it's pretty cold and they've been in there a little while. Now you'll see I'm moving around the air bubble and I disturbed it by to uh, poking it. And you can see that we have gone from no ice crystals to a considerable number of ice crystals in the blue one while I'm holding it, which should be warming it up. That's pretty cool, huh? That's the power of nucleation. So one last thought about shape and heat transfer. As you saw in the uh, other video that is about using crystallization and its thermodynamics, it's difficult to trap flavors in our uh, ice pop. It's difficult because they don't fit into the crystal lattice, and so our best method for doing that is to freeze things very quickly. As, and as we just discussed, uh, to, we also need the temperature to be rather low in order to freeze this at all. Just hitting zero degrees Celsius won't work. So our question is, how do we freeze things quickly? And we should think about the three kinds of heat transfer we talked about before and decide which of these is most relevant here and look at that equation again. Remember, there's radiation, convection, and conduction. I think we could all agree that putting things in a freezer uh, where radiation is probably not our uh, biggest method of heat transfer. And the air isn't really moving all that much in the freezer. So convection isn't a big deal, isn't a big part of what's going on. So we need to be focused here on conduction. So let's pull that equation out once more. All right, so conduction in one direction, and we're gonna throw up our star of simplification a few times here, because we're gonna pretend one direction is all we really have to pay attention to. And we see that the rate of heat, in this case, leaving our system, we wanna pull the heat out, uh, is proportional to uh, our constant, which is going to be a, a factor of what we've got mixed into our system. We're not really gonna mess with that much. The area, so what's the cross-sectional area across which energy is being transferred? And the uh, temperature difference, so this is, the temperature difference between what we uh, are pulling energy out of and uh, where that energy is going, divided by kind of the uh, distance over which that is happening. So what does this tell us? If we want Q dot to be really fast, so if we want this to be fast, what are some things we can do? Um, well, K is a constant, so we're gonna assume for the moment we can't do a lot about that but we could have a big area 
for energy to be pulled out of. So we should think about that area probably as the surface area of our popsicle. Um, and we should have a big temperature difference, right? So we want our uh, freezer to be way below zero. Uh, and we want the thickness over which this energy has then got to travel to be relatively small. So all of that is to say that those little plastic baggy freezy pops are just about ideal, especially for home where you don't necessarily have a big delta T because they've got a whole bunch of surface area and your delta X, which is like the maximum distance anything has to travel, uh, any of that energy has to travel, is really pretty small. It's less than a centimeter. And so these could freeze uh, reasonably rapidly, even though they are uh, not in an industrial freezer. If you want to make a big time popsicle uh, quickly, well, that's going to have uh, possibly a larger delta X. Uh, so you'll want a bigger delta T to go with it. Now, something else that we can control is how much area there is. And you'll notice a lot of popsicles tend to be shaped so that they have a whole lot of surface area relative to their volume. Uh, so lots of area. They're often cylinders, even when they're not tubes. So does that make sense? The other thing, of course, that impacts the shape of a popsicle is not merely the energy transfer, although that's a big deal. Um, you want, of course, people to be able to conveniently eat them. Uh, so having a popsicle that is uh, much bigger or wider than most people can actually fit in their mouths, not a very practical design, but also not a great design for heat transfer either.